The problem they're trying to solve is the following. We know from a long series of experiences, you know, 30 or more business cycles since the end of World War II, that when the U.S. is in a recession, you have to cut interest rates 3 to 4% to get the U.S. out of a recession. You need three to 400 basis points of cuts to get the U.S. It's like a plane heading for the ground. How do you pull it out of a nosedive and get it back up in the sky? The answer is 300 basis points of cuts. How do you cut interest rates 300 basis points when you're only at 75 basis points? The answer is you can't. And forget about negative rates. The evidence is now pretty good that negative rates do not work. In other words, negative rates are not more of the same. When you go from, let's say, a half of 1%, and you go to a quarter, and then you go to zero, and then you keep going to negative 25, you didn't just ease by another 25 basis points. The evidence from Japan and Europe is that you're through the looking glass and you have very strange effects, really unintended consequences. I'll give you a couple examples. So the conventional theory is, well, the more I cut interest rates, the more stimulus I get. That's a joke, but that's what they think. But if I go negative, you're absolutely going to go out and spend the money. Because if you don't spend the money, I'm going to take it away. You sit there long enough, you'll have nothing left in your bank account because I'm going to take, with these negative interest rates, I'm going to take it away. So people will run out and spend and the other thing is that, you know, it's, it's obviously, you know, from the lending point of view, they'll borrow money, you know, because the bank pays you to be a borrower. But here's what happens in the real world. And this is the difference between academics and human beings. When people see negative interest rates, people have goals in mind. They have lifetime goals, right? They want a kid's education, parents' health care, their own health care, retirement. If you start taking their money away with negative rates, guess what they do? They save more. They're like, hey, I got to put my kids through college. You're taking my money. Well, I better save more. And then what kind of signal is the central bank sending with negative interest rates? They're sending a deflationary signal. So people go, well, if, you're, if you think it's going to be deflation, I'm not going to spend money. I'll wait till the price comes down. So you're trying to encourage lending and spending. And what you get is more savings and no spending, deferred spending. You get the exact opposite of what you want. So again, another uh, egghead experiment gone awry. But the point being, so negative rates don't work. So zero bound really is zero. It really is a boundary. And you know, Bernanke has said this in his recent writings. And, and I think he's right about that. So back to the problem. How do you cut interest rates to 300 basis points when you're at 75? Well, the answer is you can't. So you have to raise them to 300 basis points. So the problem the Fed is trying to solve is how do they get rates to three and a quarter percent before the next recession? Now, I'm not saying the Fed sees a recession, and that's easy because the Fed never sees a recession. In 102 years, the Fed has never seen a recession, never forecast a recession. But they know their economic history. We are eight years into an expansion. This is, it, it feels punk. I mean, the growth is anemic, but you know, labor force participation is low, productivity is dropping. There are a lot of bad things going on. But in fact, we are in the eighth year, actually coming up on, soon be entering the ninth year of an expansion, which began in June 2009. Right. By the way, you have a hard time convincing most Americans that we're not still in a recession. Depressions are different than recessions. You know, The technical definition of a recession is Two consecutive quarters of declining GDP with rising unemployment, a couple other bells and whistles, little subjective factors, but that's basically it. So people, when you say depression, they're like, huh, depression sounds worse than a recession. And if recession is two quarters of declining GDP, then a depression must be like 10 quarters of declining GDP because it's got to be worse. But that's not the definition. The definition of a depression, you can have growth in a depression, but it's below trend growth. In other words, if trend is three, three and a half, and you're actually banging out one and a half, two, that gap between, let's say, one and a half and three and a half percent growth, that's depressed growth. It's an output gap. It compounds over time and you never get it back. We are losing trillions of dollars of wealth. We are impoverishing future generations on a relative basis because of our inability to get back to trend growth. So the reason American people feel this and don't listen to the economists and they're right is because we're in a depression. So leaving that aside, the Fed at least understands the business cycle and the fact that the next recession, you know, they say they don't die of old age, but they do die. And we're getting closer to the next one. So they are in a desperate race to get rates up to three and a half percent before the next recession hits so they can cut them to get out of the recession. The question is, can you raise rates enough to cure the next recession without causing the recession you're preparing to cure? That's the dilemma. That's the finesse. My answer is no, they're not going to be able to do it, but they think they can why are they in this box? Well, because Bernanke should have raised rates in 2010, 2011, in the early stages of the expansion, when the economy would have been much better able to bear it than it is now. Bernanke skipped a whole cycle. He skipped a whole rate increase cycle. 
to pursue these wacky experiments and, you know, QE and zero interest rate policy and all that. I spoke to Bernanke about this and he used the word experiment. He said this was an experiment. He, you know, Bernanke made his academic reputation by studying the Great Depression, you know, in the wake of Friedman and Anna Schwartz and some others. But he, he was a great scholar of the Great Depression and he got his chance to kind of try out his theories. But what he told me was, he said, 30 years from now, some new Ben Bernanke, some young scholar will look back and tell us if we did a good job or not. We actually don't know right now. See, the, the Great Depression was, was really two technical recessions, 29 to 33 and then 1937, 38. But from 33 to 37, we had an expansion. But the whole thing was a depression because we never got out of it. You know, the stock market recovered the 1929 high in 1954. It was a long time to get back to even. But Bernanke's mantra was doing something is better than doing nothing. I completely disagree. It's better to do nothing if you don't know what you're doing. And this is really the monetary equivalent of the Hippocratic Oath. You know, doctors say, you know, first rule of being a doctor is first do no harm. Anyway, bottom line is by pursuing QE and zero interest rate policy, Bernanke failed to raise rates during the early stages of a cyclical expansion, which he should have done. If he had, if he had, the economy would have been just fine and we'd be able to cut them today, but he didn't. So Janet Yellen now has to make up for lost time. So that's the mission. But again, and this is what the market completely does not get. And the Wall Street economists don't get, nobody gets this because they see the Fed raising rates and they've done the correlations and the regressions back to World War II and they go, huh, Every time the Fed raises rates, the economy is getting stronger. So if the Fed's raising rates, the economy must be getting stronger. So bid up stock prices, et cetera. But that's like saying umbrellas cause rain. In other words, they've got the causality backwards. The Fed never leaves the economy, ever. The Fed follows the economy. So a normal business cycle looks like this. So you get a little expansion going and unemployment starts to go down and industrial capacity utilization starts to go up and inflation starts to go up. And the Fed's watching, 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 and then it keeps going. They go, oh, it's getting a little hot. We better raise rates. And they raise rates. But of course, they started too late. The expansion keeps going. Inflation keeps going up. Unemployment keeps going down. Then the economy starts to cool down. Unemployment goes up and then prices go down and the past utilization drops. And we get into a recession like, huh, we better cut. You know, and then they cut and cut and cut and cut. And then you hit the bottom and then you come out of it again. So think of that as like a nice, pretty sine wave, right? That's a business expansion, business contraction over and over 30 or so times since the end of World War II, with the Fed always following the economy, never leading the economy. So all the big brands on Wall Street, they've got all this data and they say, well, every time the Fed raises rates, the economy is getting stronger. That has absolutely been true for like 30 times since the end of World War II. It is not true today. The reason it's not true today is because Bernanke skipped the cycle and they're playing catch up. For the first time since 1937, the Fed is tightening into weakness. That is a key thing to bear in mind. The Fed is tightening into weakness. They are not leading the economy to strength. They are not responding to strength, even though Wall Street thinks they are. And there's a great danger that they're actually going to cause the recession they're preparing to cure, as I mentioned. The Fed will raise rates 25 basis points four times a year from now until the middle of 2019 until they get them to three and a quarter percent. So like clockwork, every March, June, September, December, for 2017, 2018, into 2019, look for a Fed rate hike until they get to three and a quarter percent, at which point they'll be able to say, all right, now we're three and a quarter. If we have a recession tomorrow, we can cut them back down to zero again and get out of it. That'll be mission accomplished. Now, this is why I was sitting there in December, like, yep, they're going to raise them in March. And right now I'll tell your listeners they're going to raise them in June. There's your Fed response function. There's your baseline scenario. What are the exceptions to Fed rate hike. And under what conditions will they not raise rates? Because this, everything I just described to you, they've had in mind since March 2015 when Yellen took patients out of the statement. That was the end of forward guidance. And by the way, if you go back to 2015, you know, I said they're not going to raise rates all year and they weren't going to do the lift off that, that people were looking for in March, June, September. And they didn't lift off in September because the Chinese rate exchange devaluation, the stock market fell out of bed August 2015. Finally, they raised them in December 2015, and Wall Street was ready for March. I said, no, in June, no, September, no. It wasn't until December 2016 that they raised them the second time. So obviously, there are conditions under which they 
don't raise rates, notwithstanding the baseline scenario. So what are those conditions? There are three. Well, four, actually. So if you see job creation below 75,000, that will cause them to pause. By the way, pause is the key word. If you go home through the speeches, you'll see the word pause in Dudley's recent remarks. Pause is the Fed's jargon for we're not going to raise rates. We got the gym scenario, which I took from the Fed. It's their scenario. Or a technical recession. So, you know, we're going to know Friday what the first quarter GDP is. It's pretty close to negative, but I'm not saying we're in a recession now. We might be. But if you see a recession, they'll pause. If you see job creation below 75,000, they'll pause. By the way, that's a very low bar. You know, if you see a jobs report, see, this is the other thing that confuses Wall Street. You see a jobs report with 100,000 jobs. So Wall Street goes, oh, that report's really weak. The Fed's going to think twice. No, 75,000 is the number. Yellen told us that. It was in one of her speeches. You just have to be a geek like me and, and read all the speeches. So the third factor would be disinflation. So the Fed has this 2% inflation target. They missed it for six years. They're finally getting close to hitting it. By the way, I think the listeners know they use the uh, PCE core deflator year over year. There's PPI and CPI and core, and a bunch of inflation indices, but we know what they use. PCE, core deflator year over year. That actually has been getting close to 2%. But if you see it turn around, if you see that gap down to like 1.5, 1.4, 1.3, 1.3, then they will pause. The last condition for the pause is a disorderly decline in the stock markets more than 5%. If you see a 6 7 8% decline, so if the S&P went down 100 points, Fed doesn't care. Dow Jones goes down 1,000 points, Fed doesn't care. But beyond that, if you see the S&P start to go down 150 or the Dow start to go down 1,500 points in a disorderly way, it looks a little scary. It looks like there's no bottom. It looks like if you see that, they'll pause. So the Fed is going to raise like clockwork four times a year for the next two and a half years, unless you see job creation below 75,000, disinflation, a technical recession. If you don't see one of those things, they're going to raise rates. And so right now, I don't see any of them. I mean, they could all happen, but it looks like, you know, growth is going to be positive. Job creation has been decent, you know, over 100,000. Disinflation is probably coming, but not quite here yet. And they'll want to see a couple months in a row. And the stock market's not crashing. So none of the pause conditions are in place. Therefore, they will raise rates. Simple. 